Hello everybody and welcome to a very special edition of GameSpot Presents Now Playing. We are down here in Santa Monica visiting Treyarch, the developer behind Call of Duty Black Ops, and we're here to check out a pretty hefty chunk of the game's online multiplayer. I'm joined by David Van Vonderhaar, the game design director, who's here to pretty much walk us through the experience and tell us uh, how, you know, how they approached the game and what the final version is going to be like once you guys finally get your hands on it very soon. David, thanks for joining us. Thank you, man. My pleasure. So, uh, the Call of Duty series is obviously a franchise that people feel very strong about it. You have some very, very adoring fans out there. So, when you approach a new game like this, I'm sure it's a, it's a tough balance to find between, you know, adding new features that people are going to love and making sure not to take out the ones that people already love, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a pretty challenging assignment, right? Because there are some things that people are very, very attached to. Mm -hmm. But on the same front as a game designer, you have to keep pushing forward and you have to continue to innovate. So to balance those two things starts pretty early in pre-production phase. Yeah. And um, just to be really honest about it, there's some super, super brutal you know, dialogue about that, <laughs> about trying to sort that out. So we've actually got the game running right here. Uh, we've got our friend John from Activision who is playing for us. Uh, David, tell us what's happening. What, what's the map that we're looking at here? I know that Black Ops is sort of a... Uh, a globe-trotting story. You go all, all over the world. What's this location we're looking at here? This is uh, what we call Havana. It's obviously Havana, Cuba. Mm -hmm. And it uses the Operation 40 faction versus the Troopas. So, uh, you know, we're, we're roaming the streets of Havana in what looks to be a domination game right now. And uh, these guys are trying to cap all these flags. And you need to, you get points, of course, in domination when you're capping flags. And uh, right now they're running behind schedule, but if they cap all three, they'll get points pretty quickly and can uh, take this game. All right. So Domination, obviously one of the familiar modes for the, uh, veterans of the Call of Duty series. Have you guys added any, uh, any other new modes into the mix? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different things. So um, at, the, you know, at the very high level, with the base core game modes that people are familiar with, like Domination, we've added uh, what we call the bare bones variation. So this is something that fans had asked for and uh, that we, we did. So you know, you, may, you know the game is probably core, and then a lot of people also know the hardcore version of the game, which removes the HUD and makes the game deadlier. But there's also a bare bones variation of every game mode, or there could be. Uh, and what bare bones allows us to do is selectively figure out which kill streaks to either have in the game or take all the kill streaks out. But on top of that, we can also force people to use default classes, or we could say, hey, there's only going to be a level three kill streak, and this is what it's going to be. And it lets us modify and change that when the game's actually in the retail world uh, as time over time and as uh, the, the needs of the fans uh, change, and they do change. Absolutely. Now, we should probably mention off the bat here that we're starting off on a fairly low level. I think we're at level three, so we, we should get a good sense of some of the... Uh, the initial progression and unlockables that you get when you uh, when you start the game, right? Yeah, John John's running with uh, MP5K, which is one of the default weapons in the SMG class. Being only level three, he's only got a couple of base classes and weapons available to him. And then, like in previous games, of course, as he ranks up, he'll start unlocking more features mm -hmm. and he'll start unlocking more weapons. Enemy spy plane above. Now, as a, you know, as a designer of uh, multiplayer games, there's I'd imagine one of the biggest uh, challenges is making sure that uh, you know there's that sense of reward for the really really high level players, but also making sure that the low level guys like what we're seeing here are still able to be competitive in a match, right? Yeah, you know it's really important that no absolutely new player, uh, you know, can't have fun playing the game. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens at very early levels. Uh, you know, in a way, it's it's not necessarily intrinsically part of the design, but it's certainly discussed a lot, which is, at a very low level, what are going to be the default weapons? Because if you don't have a positive experience using a weapon very early on, you can get turned off right away. So this MP5K, for example, it's a pretty easy-to-use gun, and it's fairly representative of all the SMGs in the game, right? It's what we call a baseline gun. Mm -hmm. So SMGs are either sort of... Uh, more deadly but less accurate, or less accurate, um, you know, and, but more deadly from this point. So that's pretty common thing to do in the early levels. So a guy like John here with an early gun can, you know, still have his fair share of fun. All right, and um, 
the the other players in the match, it looks like they're roughly the the same level. It doesn't look like we're seeing anything too outlandish and uh, high level in terms of what they're carrying around. Is that the case? Yeah, um, John, could you hit your scoreboard for a second? Let's take a look here. Yeah, so you know these guys were ranging anywhere from three to nine. It looks like. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, so you know, there's nothing. There's there, there, no one player in this match is going to be. Um, you know, have you outmatched simply by his level. But then, to be really honest about it, it, it doesn't really matter if you get ranked with the higher level player. The only mm -hmm. thing that's really telling you is that that guy's played the game longer than you, right? right? We don't really tune weapons uh, to be something that gets better or worse over time. They just get different, right? right? You don't want to intrinsically create an environment where higher ranked players have advantages over lower ranked players. Right, and we have the prestige system, if you're familiar with that from, from previous games, where you can actually give up your rank and start over for a little bit of prestige, icons and some other bonuses that we give you. So, you know, you could have a really high-ranked player with, who's played the game way more than you, who's a lower level than you because he's prestige, right? So, yeah, we go out of our way, I think, to say, look, these are just different guns. You know, there's nothing that says you are going to have a better or worse time as a result of being a higher or lower rank. So let's talk about the, um, the, the timeline of the game, the sort of setting of the game, these you know, CIA deniable ops missions that you're taking part in. How has that influenced the, uh, the, the, you know, the maps that we're fighting in and the equipment that we use? Yeah, um, so you know, we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll get into the, the user interface side of this in a minute, but it had actually a, a massive influence on the game design as a whole. So you know, when we're doing research and pre-production, as we often do, you know, we're looking through sort of what what the kinds of special operatives would do and use in those time periods and when they were you know going and being places they weren't supposed to be and mm -hmm. they would use highly modified enemy weaponry they would take their personal weapons that their personal firearms that they've bought or had shipped to them into battle and those things had a big influence on the gun customization system that's available in you know Call of Duty Black Ops and it's one of the reasons why we have so many camo patterns that you can unlock and purchase because guys would just spray paint their guns they're like F it I need, <laughs> I need this you know I need the gun to be this color you, know, you didn't have the when you're a special operations soldier you don't have the military breathing down your back about right. doing bad things to your gun you just do whatever you need to do and that was an influence for the game design in a really significant fashion and I assume that uh, when you drop your gun and somebody else comes and picks it up it's still visible there for the other players? Absolutely. So, you know, it's really fun to um, to take somebody's gun, his highly customized gun, <laughs> right? His gun with his own camo, his own clan tag, his own reflex sight, Security. with his own aiming reticle color, with his own aiming reticle design, and then kill him with it, and then have him see that in the kill cam, <laughs> In the right? kill cam. Yeah. So we've, we've got a few seconds until the next match. Let's talk about the, uh, the equipment screen, the creative class screen that we're seeing here. Yeah, John's uh, in the perk two and he's browsing through the perk. So he's unlocked all the perks now. He's level five, so he's ranked up. And what he can do is look at any perk category that he wants. And then he, you can see he, that any perk is available for purchase. So you don't unlock perks by level anymore. You unlock every one of them with the exception of the pro versions. Mm -hmm. And as, excuse me, as long as you have enough money, you can actually purchase that. So John's got you know, a little over 1,000 CP, so he can't afford any more perks right now. So CP, we should, uh, let's spend a little time talking about that. How did that idea originate? I imagine that there's probably a lot of back and forth, whether that was too big of a risk to take with the multiplayer system. Um, you know, we, we knew that we were, so the, the concept of, the, the Call of Duty points are just simply CP or the currency. Mm -hmm. This came up probably in day two of pre-production, oh, really? right? We knew pretty early on that this is a direction that we wanted to go. And we had done a lot of paper prototyping to see if it made sense to us. But yeah, of course, when you, when you go from a non-economy game to an economy <laughs> game, it's a big deal to people, oh, right? Yeah. When you go to an unlock game to an economy game. But, you know, ultimately, We've thought that after you know a couple of games of doing the unlock mechanism, it was really time to kind of infuse a different take on that system, right? Right. So you know, so for us, the what we really were interested in is being able for players to have more control over the experience than they could get if we were spoon feeding them, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to find the right balance of how far to take that, right? 
So in things like perks and kill streaks, those are still features that unlock and then you purchase the one that you want. Right. But things like weapons, those still unlock and then you decide if you want to buy them. But if you buy them, then you unlock almost everything for that weapon. You can go buy the attachments for it right away. That takes out a little bit of the grind that happens, trying to grind for your attachments. Right. And it's just a different take, right? That's a fun system too. It's just a, it's a matter of trying to evolve that concept a bit and uh, have Treyarch put their mark on a, on a way of doing that. Uh -huh. and, and that's really what that was about for us. Let's, let's take a look at the, um, uh, actually we're looking at that right now. So uh, the, the idea of the, the, the class system, you, you're actually wearing different outfits and it affects your attributes in the game? Yeah, so for every Call of Duty game uh, to date, the way that your character principally looks had been determined based on what gun you were holding. Right. Right, which is not a bad system at all. Um, but we had this idea for giving players more control over their experience, and some people really care about how they look, you know? Uh, so it started from this, how, how are we gonna give people the ability to control what they look, which by itself was interesting, but not as good enough as associating it with a gameplay mechanic. Mm -hmm. So we went through a couple of ideas and finally settled on this, this concept that these perk one, right? The base perk, the base gameplay defining attribute of a player is perk one. And if we make those perks have a visualization and change the character, then you can really start to see what that guy is likely to be doing inside the game. If you've got Ghost and you're wearing a, you know, lots of ghillie or camouflage, you'll have an idea what that guy's play style is. So you can figure out by looking at him how to engage that player. And that's a that's the start of something really big, I think. Cool. John's looking at the contracts menu right now, which is uh, one of the one of the many things you can do inside of a lobby in between games. And there's three types of contracts, right? The mercenary contracts, the operations contracts, and the specialist contracts. And then John can dig through here on the specialist contracts. We like, we like to refer to specialist contracts as contracts for specialized players. Bag of heads, get three headshots with submachine guns, right? So there's various kind of clever, unique, you know, very specialized players, like guys who like to go after headshots and that's their thing. They'll want to pick up a contract so they can get a little extra CP for it along the way. Right, so I, we think the contracts is a nice way to engage with what traditionally had been the challenges system, where those th challenges, of course, still exist, but they're passive. They just exist. You unlock them. You get them. Right. That's the like the surprise, right? Yay! Okay, I got the challenge. That's cool. But contracts let people actually put a little of their own investment in because you have to pay for them. Oh, okay. Right, and then once you pay for them, you could, if you accomplish the contract within the time frame, then you'll get paid back even more. So that's that level of interaction between systems level design and users that we think is really engaging and fun for players. Yeah, so John's in a Perk Pro menu right now, and Perk Pros you still have to complete challenge groups for, so rather than just one challenge, you have to actually complete three challenges to even unlock the pro version, and then once you've unlocked it, you still have to purchase it. So the pro versions are pro, right? That's all business. So there's an example of where those two systems come together. I mean, not only do you have to do a challenge, you have to do three challenges. So, you know, it, it's a, the way that the game is configured and set up, it's, you know, most things are feature unlocks, but some things are challenge unlocks, right? So whatever made the most sense for what the award was, for doing it, so that's that's what the motivation there was, right? Marathon 26 miles and you know first blood, right? This is a gameplay thing. So mm -hmm. what we're trying to say is, hey, look, guys who have marathon, they're going to be the guys who run in and engage first right. and have those first engagements. So you should give them something to do that would a marathon type user would using, and first blood is one of those things, right? And then finally on the captures front, hey, look, if you're you know a marathon guy then you're often a CTF player, mm -hmm. so you need to capture flags. So I'm really excited about the pro versions and, and what they bring and the challenges that you need to do to get them. I mean, they're legit challenges. You have to do these things, and you sorry, but you're not gonna unlock the pro version if you don't go play CTF and cap flags. That's how it's gonna be. All right, so we've started a, uh, a match here on a map called Nuketown, right? That's right, this is Nuketown, and it is perhaps the smallest map that we have in the multiplayer side of things, and it features a double rainbow. <laughs> and it's a quarter departure from Havana. This looks like a nice little slice of uh, Americana right here. In fact, you've got the Treyarch school bus, it looks like. Uh, you know, this map was um, influenced by, uh, you know, those sort of sets that they would build in the desert to basically nuke 
as a test. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, if you've ever seen the, the, any of the, the last Indiana Jones movie, for example, they, they have that kind of town in there. And if you've ever watched any of those crazy documentaries about how to escape from Fallout, you know, <laughs> uh, in, the, in the late 60s and early 70s, you'll see these towns and they built these replications of these towns and we're like, this is just too much fun and there's so much camp here that we have to incorporate this thing in a map. And so, you know, this is our fun map. This map's really just for fun. And the, uh, the mannequins add sort of a campy, but also at the same time, slightly eerie element. Yeah, they're, they're slightly creepy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're playing, uh, when you're playing without many players, if you're playing like a smaller game, like three on three or four on four, you know, you got guys will stand still next to mannequins uh, and, and confuse the issue for you. There's a sign inside this map right in front of John there. What it actually tells you, if you if you go to the front of that sign and look at it, it'll actually tell you how many players are currently in the in the nuke town at this time. Oh, okay. So we'll try to get some footage of that. This map has a specialized RCXD car path that lets you go from one side of the map to the other in a back alley. Uh, this map features it's got the double rainbow. This map has got. Um, this map, this map also has um, a really special surprise that we'll get to when the match ends. I feel compelled to ask about the player bursting into flames when he dies. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, the, these guys have got some flamethrowers at work here, which is one of the weapon attachments. So oh, okay. they're, they're going to get toast up pretty good. So, <laughs> so John, if you get toasted, don't skip that kill cam so we can show everybody in the world what happened there. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the uh, flamethrower used to be a, a weapon, right, a perk one weapon in, the, in Call of Duty World at War, and this time we stuck it as an attachment and under the barrel attachment. So and John now, in fact, now that he's ranked up and he has his MP5, rather than spending money on something else, it looks like he's customized his gun, so now he's got a reflex on there with probably a red dot, circle red dot. Um, so, you know, he's, he's starting the experience of going, okay, I'm going to customize this weapon for me. You know, what do I want on it, right? And, you know, and he's still only level five, so he's not waiting around for this stuff too long. He's also got a speed reload perk on. They're playing, uh, looks like they're playing Demolition. I'm just, I'm in awe at this map that you guys have built right here. <laughs> yeah. There's some sprinklers somewhere in the, <laughs> off to the side, some garden sprinklers that come up. And then, you know, I, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna give, uh, you know, just for your, I'm gonna give you guys one, one giveaway just for your audience that uh -huh. no one's ever talked about yet. And then I'm gonna leave a little bit, there's the flamethrower there at work. I'm gonna give you th this little tidbit. If you pop the heads off all the mannequins, Enemy and I mean all of them, going. and I mean in record-breaking time, <laughs> there's a little something special for you. Ooh. Takes, I, takes a well-coordinated <laughs> You're gonna have team to have people. You, you definitely need a uh, marathon, and you definitely need to know to know how to navigate your way around this map. Yeah, you, you, you need you need a you're gonna need a full team of professionals <laughs> to make this happen. But that's part of the charm, right? And we've got some butterflies as well. Yeah, of course. You know, this is a a fun little town. So you were talking a moment ago about, um, you know, we mentioned gun customization earlier, but uh, one of the things that we're not seeing quite yet as we're not at that level is the, uh, like the reticle customization, right? You can actually change it from a dot to other different patterns and sort of change the color and things, right? Yeah, that's right. So this is just the circle red dot, which is the default version. So uh, in a little bit, when uh, John ranks up, he'll have the ability to purchase different aiming reticles, so maybe you don't want a dot, maybe you want a circle, maybe you want an X, maybe you want a skull, maybe you want a smiley face. There's all sorts of different ways to configure the actual reticle that, that you're using. But then on top of that, you can actually change the color of the dot. So, you know, it's always called the red dot, but it could be a green dot, it could be a blue dot, it could be an amber dot. There's all sorts of colors and you can pick which one. And then even on top of that, he can configure the glass color. So he's using clear glass, but you can use blue and various shades and tones of glass, which depending on the map and the brightness of the map can aid in, uh, you know, your targeting and acquisition. And, you know, some of it's just purely for, uh, well, you know, just showing off. Yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine getting a, dying as a result of a headshot from a guy who's using a smiley face on his red pool is not the most, uh, rewarding feeling in the world. It is if you're the guy who got the kill. <laughs> you know, 
So John, John's uh, just finished one of the first Perk Pro challenges there. That, that's what that message was. The lightweight escaped death, which means he got hurt and then had to run away. So you know, the, the Perk Pros are like that. You know, if you're a lightweight yeah, user, you know, you want to move fast. One of the things you do as a fast mover is if you get in trouble, you can dodge around a corner. And in fact, this is a really great map for that kind of thing because mm -hmm. it's small. It's a really good place to try to accommodate those things. He just got poisoned by Nova Gas right there. That's why his screen's all blurry. Um, that, that is a type of a secondary uh, grenade that got tossed up into the world. You can purchase that, of course. He can do it uh, in the next game if he wanted to. And uh, we're, we're, we're 37 seconds away from the big finale here. Yep, that's a base challenge there, 25 kills. Very incremental, the challenges. Five headshots and 25 kills, so he's doing pretty good. Five headshots with the SMG. So those are all the challenge pop-ups. And promote it. Promote it, nice Yeah, work. with 2,500 uh, CP leveling bonus right there. Yeah, this map's never been seen before. You know, we haven't really promoted this map at all. It's, you know, it's it's a little too um, unique and different to, to really make sense for most types of you know game promotions or trailers that you might do. You know, it, I, I really think that Nuketown is going to have some really some really large fans. You know, um, I like this map a lot in private matches and with some of the private match game customization options that we have available. We like to play one on ones and two on twos in it with uh, pistol shotguns only. That's a good good fun experience. You know, and, and you know it'll hold up and it'll be in the playlist rotations for sort of the normal game modes, of course. Um, but you know, it, it's Nuketown is something special for you know when you're when you're trying to really just kind of bring it down to very few players. You know, going at it in kind of a duel environment. You know, dueling. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's where Nuketown really shines, and it you know it's just fun. It's just different and fun. So yeah, talk to us about the map design in general. How do you how do you guys try to balance uh, you know the smaller maps like Nuketown versus uh, the, the bigger maps like uh, I'm, Havana was a little bit bigger, but I imagine you guys have some some larger ones. Yeah, as well. you know Havana is a medium sized map um, by the standards that we use, and we definitely lump maps into small, medium, and large categories. Mm -hmm. And you know if you're let's you know we have 14 maps going to be available in Call of Duty Black Ops and. You know, most of those maps are going to be in the middle range size, what we call medium maps. You know, medium to medium large. And those are maps that are generally designed to work in every game mode with about 12 players, right? That's kind of the target. That's the base. Right. So, you know, if you have a magic spreadsheet of what you're trying to do, you want to get, you know, let's call it 9 to 10 maps and maybe, you know, in that range right there, that medium range. And then you want at least one pretty small map. That's Nuketown, right? This right. is the smallest map we have. There's another small map called Firing Range. It's bigger than, than Nuketown, but it's... You know, it's it's in that medium to small category as opposed to purely a small map like this. And then we have some very large maps on the extremes, Cracked, Array, those are very large maps. So, you know, you generally tune the game, and again, this is, you know, talk about game design in general, in general isn't really fair to game design at all, <laughs> but to keep it simple, you know, you generally want um, a good healthy dose of, of medium sized maps, and then you want to go to the edges, a couple couple two, couple three, as we like to say, mm -hmm. large maps and one or two small maps. And that's usually the great balance for this game, what the engine's capable of, what we think the fun factor is for the number of players and the game modes that we have. You know, we, you know, we played the game lots of ways with lots of different players, and it, you know, it always boils down to, man, this, you know, this is the right size map, this is the right number of players for that kind of awesome experience. And what's the process that you guys take in regards to designing a map, at least visually, after locations from the story campaign compared to just ones that you, you know, totally pulled out of nowhere? Yeah, so we got the chance to pull um, a lot of them in this game out of nowhere. Uh -huh. You know, Nuketown's totally out of nowhere. <laughs> Not in the campaign. Yeah, but you're still, you know, it's still a production, right? And you're still, the game goes to particular environments. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in this, in Call of Duty Black Ops, we were actually able to get started making maps really early on. So, you know, we had sort of this loose idea from the from the campaign side of things where the story was going to take us and what the environments were. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we we built maps in basic block shape, you know, um, inspired by locales, hoping the art would be there one day, right? So when you're building this map up from scratch, I mean, you know, this is a this is a finished map. These are nothing but blocks. You know, it's like playing in Legoland in a right. way. You know, it's there's nothing to it. Um, so, you know, we we usually just try to go for a good healthy balance of something totally outside the box like this map. You know, and then a good mix of where the 
story is going to be inside the game. If you're going to spend some of your story in Vietnam slash Ke uh, Laos or Cambodia, you need a couple of maps in that environment. If part of your story is going to be in the Ural, the Ural Mountains of the Soviet Union, you got to have a couple of maps there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we're doing the initial planning, we really just are looking for good reference and trying to come up with really fun maps, and we're not overly focused on the environment yet. Right. In fact, you know, Havana uh, was a completely different location altogether, and it became Havana, Cuba. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Get package ready for delivery. Locked and easy. <clears throat> There's comes his care package, so maybe we can get a good look at the helicopter here. This big old beast of a bird that's coming in to drop his care package. Um, that thing can be shot down. Uh, we've slowed it down a bit, so it, you know if it gets uh, taken out on its way in, it'll drop its care package wherever it gets destroyed. Um, you know, there's a mixed reaction from the hardcore fans about care packages. You know, I mean, why why do I get a, a higher level kill streak for having a lower level kill streak? And it's a the subject of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, conversation on the design team, but ultimately, you know, kill streaks don't count towards kill streaks. Uh, so, in this game, you know, you can't just intrinsically, uh, you know, roll through the kill streaks very fast. So I think it, you know, you, there's some players who will never get an 11 kill streak in their life. The odds of getting a really great kill streak out of a care package are pretty low. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're tuned that way. So I don't think anybody has anything to worry about here. Um, you know, you won't see as much. There's good competing kill streaks to take at that level. So um, I, I, you know, I'm pretty convinced that care packages. Uh, you know, I, I think they have a place in the game. I feel like they're appropriate, and uh, you know, it's it's pretty satisfying when that you know the random number gets in your time. Random number gets rolled, and your time is there. You know? Yeah. Don't skip the kill cams of kill streaks. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of different kill streaks, of course. Um, some of the new ones include the two weapons that we actually have available only from care packages, which is another good reason to have care packages, right? You don't you don't want something like the uh, death machine or you know to be something that you could equip with, right? That would be extremely overpowered and wouldn't make a lot of sense for a crater class weapon. But it makes perfect sense inside of a care package drop. So you know that the, that weapon, along with the Grim Reaper, which is this four banging you know rocket launcher that's just insane. <laughs> um, those two things are uh, weapons that you can only get from care packages. So you have an opportunity to give the player really super powerful weapons, rarely. And that's a lot of fun all around, you know. Um, it, it comes up and it can be game changing, and that that keeps the game interesting, right? It doesn't doesn't boil down to the same thing. That little bit of randomness inside will make things, I think, more engaging overall and keep you fresh and thinking. Sure, a little bit of controlled randomness in yeah. an otherwise very sort of, you know, deliberate environment. It is really deliberate, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's designed fairly deliberately. Um, you know, but there's new the new kill streaks include, of course, everyone's favorite, the RCXD, which is the radio control car. There's um, also some been some work against uh, you know the chopper gunner and how that works. That's very Vietnam movie influence, where you're quite literally sitting on the side of the helicopter with the gun, right, as opposed yeah. to just a gun camera, okay. right. So that's a lot of fun. There's the gunship, which is actually a pilotable helicopter, so you can mm -hmm. actually fly it around. So, you know, there's some really new kill streaks um, that, you know, we think it, the fans are going to be pretty into. You know, there's 11 of them. Uh, there's not too many, so it's not sort of overwhelming. They've got counters, right? There's a SAM turret, which is in fact a kill streak designed to take out air kill streaks. So, you know, there's a good healthy balance there, and you know, having a lot isn't really the way to win <laughs> necessarily. Uh -huh. You know, having um, you got to have a good number because the customizable kill streak feature is amazingly fun. Um, you know, but you gotta you gotta find a healthy dose of uh, counters for them too, because you don't want them to to be the dominant part of the game. Any chance of bringing back the German Shepherds from World at War? Yeah, the dogs are back. The German <laughs> Shepherds have returned. They're an 11 kill streak, and they're just as deadly as just ever. Just as vicious. And they have uh, they have brand new uh, behaviors too. They're a little smarter. Oh, can nice. Can target a little better. Here it comes. This is what happens at the end of a game in Nuketown. Doesn't matter if things go your way or don't go your way. <laughs> it's Nuketown. All Nuketowns end with a nuclear flash. 
And there's nothing for those mannequins to do mm -hmm. but just look and they're all, wish they lived in a different town. <laughs> and they're all dead now. <laughs> yeah, so John went on a big tear there. You can see he was playing an objective-based game mode, so it's a longer game mode, so he's unlocked a lot of weapons along the way, being level 9 now. You know, so good, good bonus there, over 7,000. Um, CP award it for him in that big long session and that's going to be enough to buy some more stuff so let's see what uh, John's into. I'd recommend we take a look at uh, some of the gun customizations features in primary and then yeah and then primary again yeah so yeah. so let's can we flip through that um, yeah just flip down so let's see where he's got to go sorry John can I have the controller I'm going to take over for John for just a second so we can kind of see what we're, what we're going to deal with here and how we get into this gun customization stuff over time. So camo is level 22, so we got a ways to go there. Level 25 for the reticles, reticle color and lenses. Level 19 for his clan tag, we'll probably get there today. And finally level 16 here for the emblem, which so if we talk about the player card, you can actually stick your emblem on your gun for a continued personalization effort. So these, this is what we mean by feature unlocks, right? Mm -hmm. So this is locked. You cannot put camo on your gun until level 22. But once you unlock that feature, you'll be able to put any camo on any gun you have, right? So you don't have to grind to get the camo. There's no challenges to complete to get the camo. Okay. If you got the cash and you're a personalization kind type of person, that's what uh, you like to do, then you'll just buy that, right? You'll just buy what you need, right? And that's how you chose to spend your money as opposed to other stuff. So if people don't mind an overwrought metaphor, it's almost as if the XP is the key into the store and then the uh, the CP is what you use to actually buy that's, the customization. Not a bad metaphor, actually, you know? And, and once you have, once you get to a certain rank via the XP, you get into the better stores, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't get to go into any stores early on, and then uh, as time goes by, you get to get into the face paint store and you can start painting up your face, right? So it, there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of features that unlock by leveling. And then once you've unlocked that face paint, you can buy any face paint. And then even within those types of things, we do some specialized stuff. So as a quick example here, you can see that here's guns unlocking by levels. But here, this very last gun in this chain, you actually have to purchase a whole bunch of guns to declassify. Oh, okay. So we're constantly sort of mixing this up, right? So you've got features, they unlock, you've mm -hmm. got challenges that unlock uh, the pro versions of perks which you have to purchase. Here we have the classified system, and the classified system requires you to buy all the content in that category. You know, so there's three or four ways in which we make the economy fairly interesting and keep you having to pay attention and then, you know, make you want to buy those contracts or do those wager matches to earn the, the money you need to buy that stuff. So David, we've we've talked a bit about the uh, the currency and the economy in the game, but we haven't really touched on um, one of the most bold elements of it, which is the gambling of the element of it. So uh, we've actually got that going right here. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, this is one in the chamber. Um, this is a free for all game mode, um, and what's happening right here is you have a pistol, and with one bullet in the chamber, and if you shoot that bullet, you're done you've got to hit somebody to refill the ammo. There's no weapon drops, there's no picking ammo off the ground, and it's a very deadly game because you only have three lives to live. Oh, okay. One in the Chamber was the prototype game mode for wager matches. It was mm -hmm. the first one we did, and uh, we just loved it right away, right? It's really pure. It's a game of stalking your opponent. You're trying to guess, do they have a bullet? They're trying to guess how many bullets you have, you get the action that, that happened just right there where you're looking for those red dots, you're, you're basically trying to ambush somebody <laughs> who's currently in the middle of a game, and uh, the, you know, that's the secret to winning, um, psyching out your opponent, man, you'll get these really amazing dances, like right Ooh. there, right? Final she took life. her shot, Rizzo missed, gets knifed, now that guy's got at least one if not two bullets in his chamber. Game continues till uh, you run out of lives. Top three players get paid. It's called being in the money. It's it's almost like the very end of an action movie. The hero has his gun. There's only one <laughs> bullet left in the chamber, and he's trying to take care of the villain, right? Yeah, here, it, you know, in the oh, intricate oh bullet dance, right? These two, <laughs> these two guys could probably, uh, if this was an action movie, you know, you got to have a big fist fight at the end, you know, throwing <laughs> down your weapons. So 
you know, uh, there, uh, Cod Black Ops right there is uh, second. This is the, the low limit playlist, right? Only 118 Cod points, doesn't sound like a lot. There's various levels of playlist um, so that people can play with their friends in this one. Since not much money's at line, this is like playing penny poker with you know me and you on a weekend around right. with some friends. But then you know the price goes up, so uh, you can play all sorts of ways here um, to get uh, you know to continue to get paid. When you guys introduced uh, wager matches last month, that's probably one of the things that took people by surprise the most is the, the, the element of taking these, you know, this currency that you've built up over time and then just putting it all on the line for, for glory. How, talk about how that idea originated. Uh, yeah. And you, know, you mentioned that you guys are big fans of gambling. How did you know <laughs> that you, you know, I, I'm, a big fans of, I'm a big fan of sandwiches. That doesn't necessarily mean that I put them into a video game, you know? Sure, yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so when we had an when we built the economy system, you know, we were trying to figure out ways to keep the economy engaging. Uh -huh. There's lots of ways to do that, and when, you know, we just asked ourselves this kind of basic question: If you had some spare money lying around, mm -hmm. right, what would you do with it? As right. a, as just like a, a a member of the human race, what might you do with with some extra money? You know, no one really has extra money, but let's <laughs> say that we have some extra money. Um, and there was really two things: we go and we spend it on things we don't need, things that you know uh, make our cars nicer, or you know some uh, nice shirts like you have. <laughs> Thank you. You know, so we spend it on personalization items, things that identify us as people, right? And then the other thing we do, especially as game makers is we might get on a plane and head to Vegas for a weekend, right? <laughs> and, uh, and gamble a little bit for the chance to get even more yeah, money. So wager matches were directly born out of this concept of what do you do with money and how would you spend money and how would you spend money to make even more money, right? right? And that's really how that came about. <clears throat> now, was there, is there any sort of concern that like it may widen the, the the gulf between like the real right. expert players and the low level players the, for those guys who just don't know when to quit when they keep putting too much money on the line they yeah. don't realize that they're not all that good yeah well so i actually hope that happens <laughs> right because that's a microcosm of life in a way right. right so so i don't mind that that happens but the truth is you can always go earn currency the you know the normal way and the normal way being just playing the game you get about 10% of your currency for for the ten percent of your experience can be paid out as currency. So really, if you run out of money, all you have to do is go play the game. Right. But then on top of that, you can still earn currency with the contract system and even some high level challenges. So there's always ways to make more money. But if you get this nice cycle of I'm playing wager matches and I lose, and I got to go back and work some more and mm -hmm. then come back and play, you know that's what makes uh, you know gambling fun in a way. And I imagine it was a lot of fun coming up with the different modes for wager match as well, because that's something that you guys just built from the ground up, you know. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. You know, there's a lot of influence out there in the in from the community side of things, from lots of games that have done some mods. There's some influence driven by the mods that are in here. There's some completely new uh, contraptions in here. You know, we went through a lot of different ideas, including some team-based wager matches that we ultimately decided that we didn't want to ship with. You know, so we we went through a couple of different ways to come up with these four. Here you go with sticks and stones. There's a little game mechanic here called doubling down. So if all the players in the lobby think it's a good idea, they all go double down, that'll double the size of the bet. But it takes every all six players. Um, all wager matches are played with six players exactly. You can't, mm -hmm. can't have fewer than six, can't have more than six. And that's very intentional and deliberate. All right, sticks and stones. Crossbow, a ballistic knife, and a tomahawk. It's a good combination. Yeah, this is the, you know this sticks and stones is in a way born of this concept of basically taking our, our unique specialist weapons and featuring them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why you have a crossbow, a tomahawk, and a ballistic knife. And uh, you know if you actually get a good kill with uh, with these things, the ballistic knives and the tomahawks will award the oh, most points. God. I'm sorry, I'll try that again. The crossbow and the ballistic knife here award the most points and a tomahawk will actually zero out someone's score. So, you know, you have to, this is a good way really for players who, um, these are in a way some of the hardest weapons to use in the game, but here's mm -hmm. a game mode that features them so you can actually practice with them, right? Get They're the both money. projectile weapons, which means they have a level of arc, speed is important, you know, it's not a super fast magic bullet, you know, that you normally get from the guns. So it's a really good way um, to just let the, let the chaos reign 
as players, um, you know, can get together. You can see the stuck icon. Mm -hmm. So it's the we added that because we got to have gotten the feedback that you want to make sure you people understand that their you know their time is at an end. Uh, Rizzo here, she's playing in uh, a map called Cracked, and this is a really large map normally. And uh, you know she's she's in this corner, but and when you're playing in wager matches all the really large maps have got new boundaries defined. So you take a map that's really large and we quite literally cut it in half. You get areas that you'd normally be able to get to, you can't get to anymore when you're playing in wager matches. And we think that's a way to make sure that you can have every map still be really fun right. inside of wager matches, right? And that, that was uh, something that's never been done before. Uh, you know, It's like two maps in one that way and I think we're sort of got some new technology with that now, and, and with that, I think we can really do some really clever stuff with even doing more work to change up the maps, you know, depending on what you're playing or what game mode you're playing. And I, I think that the, the potential for that kind of dynamic and changing environment is really a place we can really grow uh, as game makers. As long as you don't get too many uh, complaints from the map designer saying like, hey, I worked so hard on that car, why did you cut it out? You know, they, they do do that, um, <laughs> for sure. But uh, I think it'll be okay because what, what they're learning to do is how to work with all of these kinds of variations. And the truth is, wager match game modes are so fun that no one really minds. Uh, the extra work it takes to actually get them ready mm -hmm. for a wager match mode, uh, you know, and ultimately it's not too bad. So we've talked a lot about the weapons in uh, Sticks and Stones, but um, we, we may have glossed over the central objective of this mode. What are, what, what's, what's Rizzo trying to do here? Yeah, so um, we've subbed out uh, John for Rizzo. Uh, Rizzo's a better player, so, <laughs> so hopefully we'll get, uh, she's not doing so well today, but hopefully we'll get her in. <laughs> so this is a really simple game mode. Um, you know, you got these three specialized weapons, and you're really just trying to do point accumulation. So there's a plus 100, for um, getting a stick and killing somebody with the ballistic knife or the crossbow. So it's very accessible in that way for people, you know? You're still just trying to get the highest score. That's been the staple of, uh, you know, playing games for a very long time. So people will be able to pick it up and then that way they can use whatever energy they have to focus on, you know, uh, becoming more proficient Get with the, the weapons. Okay. There's a stick, so Rizzo will pick up a plus Out 100 for that. Uh, she just got tomahawked, right? Oh. So you could, you, you know, the VO will tell you you're out of the money. So quite literally, what happens is if you get tomahawked, you'll get what we call bankrupt. And what hap what happens with that is literally you lose all the points that you've earned to that point. Oh. So man, if you get on a tear, you got to protect your lead, right? And people can uh, can go and and lose really easily if they get humiliated like this. You know, get the tomahawk like the like the Rizzo just did. That guy is down at zero, and she's moved up to position three, and is back in the money. Yeah, so she, you know, this this is a pretty typical um, sticks and stones type game because you're constantly getting pushed in and out of the money, right? And she's riding that fine line between mm -hmm. you know last place and uh, getting paid, and that that tension is what makes wager matches really really fun and it's really evident in this game mode because it's pretty hard to get a landslide victory because you're one tomahawk away from not winning. Uh, so I guess one of the big questions for wager matches is um, in terms of you know the, the perks and the yeah, customization and the, the stuff that you've unlocked in those other game modes do they carry over into wager match? Yeah no wager match is complete standalone right create a class doesn't have a role at, at, at all, there's no kill streaks. You're not using anything you've unlocked. It is a complete pure experience. So there you go, in the money, third place, 12 CP. So, you know, um, not the best performance, but pretty, <laughs> but pretty good. Ultimately, if you get paid, that's what matters, right? That's a net gain. You're not one of those three who walk out empty-handed. That's right. So no, but you, you know, when you're playing uh, here, it, it's, com it's it's different than the regular game, right? That's why it's separated from the core and the hardcore playlist. And in fact, why you only see wager match playlists when you're looking at wager match. We wanted people to be very clear. This is a different kind of experience. You don't. You won't see any of those things you normally see in, in the lobby menu, and you, you're playing the standalone thing. You know these four brand new game modes. I think it's great. Plus, I would probably be scared to death of somebody with marathon chasing me down with ballistic knives. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, it, you would be, and and there's a there's very little um, you know way for any of that kind of stuff to happen here. 
All right, so here's the uh, the third wager match type that you were talking about, gun game. David, explain what this one's all about. You're, this is a game about the weapons and a weapon progression. So um, in the lower left-hand corner of the HUD, you'll see which weapon tier you're on. So you start at weapon one, and uh, it's this uh, revolver. And the plan here is for the player to get through every single weapon in the progression, all the way up to 20, will win the, ga the gun game. And the catch or trick in this game mode is if you get knifed, you're gonna get set back one tier. So uh, you gotta go through this progression quick and you've only got 10 minutes to do it. And uh, whoever's at the top of that tier at the end is gonna win. So there's the humiliation I was talking about. So that player gets set back and then we just get set back and we haven't gotten off the revolver yet. So there's nowhere to go yet. I, I got a chance to play some gun game um, last month, and I have to say I, I love this mode because of all the different competing strategies that work there because it, it, it forces people, you know, to use guns that they're not necessarily familiar with. So there's this, there's this challenge, this constant challenge of just working way up that tree, and eventually it, it feels like you almost get to the point where if you're close to winning, you kind of almost focus on trying to knife people. That way, that y it keeps them down, you know. Yeah, for sure. It's it's actually part of the part of the strategy if you get too close because uh, guns in the higher progression are not necessarily really great for close range combat, mm -hmm. right? Here in the early game, when we're on weapon tier six and seven, she's got SMGs. These are great guns. You can get through the SMGs and the assault rifles pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But the way the progression's set up is you are using weapons you're not familiar with early on. I mean, most people don't walk around with just a pistol, <laughs> and they don't walk around with just a crossbow and a ballistic knife or launchers at the end of the progression. <laughs> right. So you've got this really nice curve. It's kind of difficult to get started. Mm -hmm. Then you can kind of steamroll through it if you're, you know, if you're a normal player who's familiar with most of the guns in the game, right? And then you've got this really interesting dynamic where the guns, in fact, get really harder to use at the end. And uh, you know the strategies can get pretty intense because you could be a guy with an SMG going up against a guy with a sniper rifle. Mm -hmm. So the whole engagement range thing starts to play. And then you know in a way there's almost this little bit of thing you got to deal with because every time you get a kill, that's good. You're going up in tiers, but there's also the time it takes to weapon switch to the new weapon. Right. And that is where you have to be very careful. Where if you get so close to the action here, where you end up with uh, killing somebody. Then you've got this time where you got to get your, the new gun up, and if there's other people involved in the battle, mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna lose that that window of time is the time somebody else has to kill you. So you're always trying to find the strategy for gun game is to always sort of find, you know, the range or engagement at which you're gonna tackle a person based on where you are in the progression and where they are in the progression, and that's how you can get through the progression really quickly, maintaining that margin, that zone separation. Running straight at him, trying to get a <laughs> knife attack, not such a good idea. And it, it almost seems like there's points at which maybe if you're getting towards, like somebody else is clearly well in the lead and you're still just sort of trudging along at the bottom of the curve, it almost makes sense to just focus on the knife attacks because that way you're just, you know. Yeah, in fact, you can see the lead player um, when the minimap pings there in the top right hand, top left hand corner of the screen, you can see the gold, right? So you can actually use that to hunt down the number one player and try to break down some of their progression. You know, and, and uh, if you can do that more than once, you can really get that top player off their game, mm -hmm. get them um, under their skin, if you will. And, uh, and then you have a chance to kind of climb your way back up. So if you're one of these players who you know, has got the really fast eye to hand and can pay attention to both the mini map and your field of view at the same time, then you have to make a conscious decision if you want to knife the leader or you want to shoot the leader. Because you need to shoot the leader to actually progress guns. You need to shoot anybody to progress guns. You cannot progress by knifing. Yeah. You will not go to the next tier weapon. You've got to get a kill with that gun, right? So um, it's really important to decide uh, what to do when facing down somebody. And of course, whenever you talk about strategy in uh, a wager match mode like this, there's always th that thought in the back of your mind, oh, that's right, I've got money on the line here. Yeah, it's really, it's really, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been in first place with one kill to go and dropped out, and, and you know it's the most heart-wrenching feeling ever because <laughs> there's money on the line. And then I've been on the opposite side of it, you know, where 
I've gotten into first like what just happened here and I've maintained my dominance through 10, you know, 10 guns or so. And that's like, man, look how badass I am. So you, you know, it goes both ways. And it's not because the same people don't constantly win the gun game. There's so many variables at stake and what the other players are doing and who is getting humiliated and set back a level that, you know, it's not the same game. You know, I mean, yes, it's the same weapon progression, but it's never the same game. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in my personal experience, once you start unlocking like those sniper rifles, that's for me it becomes challenging because yeah. normally I don't spend a whole lot of time as a sniper, but that's what this that's what the gun game does to you. Yeah, it does, and you know, it, it'll help you. We just moved into the sniper rifles now, so here you've got to really put some separation between you and the players because you need this time to scope up, possibly to hold your breath and get that to kill. And you got to go through not just one, but two sniper rifles. So, you know, guys who are snipers, they're going to blow through these guns. But if you're not a sniper, uh, man, if you want to play the gun game, you better practice up. So this is the danger, right? So Rizzo here is waiting for someone to come to her, and all the time that's happening, people are progressing. So you run the risk that your lead that she's in right now won't be protected in the long term because um, you know she's not out looking for the action. So again, it's a it's a game of inches in so many ways and milliseconds. You, I mean, you got to be really make decisions. Am, am I moving? Am I staying still? You know. Ooh. Yeah, that was amazing. That was a shot from the hip there. Yeah, it's pretty hard. She was pretty close, so it is it is possible. Here's here's that Grim Reaper. I imagine the risk here is uh, making sure not to blow up yourself as well as the enemy. Yeah, right? that's right. In fact, if you do blow up yourself, you'll get bit set back a level as well. So suicide's a penalty, a fairly significant penalty. So oh, nice. You know, so you don't you don't want to kill yourself, and it's pretty easy to cause splash damage and kill yourself with the launcher. Oh, see, that's exactly what happens. Now that she's in first, people are gonna come, you know, come looking for her, looking for a knife attack, and you'll see how she has to back up in order to keep from killing herself mm -hmm. there. And even then, she got a little splash damage. So you have to be super careful when you're up here with these launchers. Rizzo's doing pretty well. Three guns to go. Yeah, this is this is her game because you know she's really good with the weapons. Oh, see there you go. Like the the dangers of assault rifles versus launchers, right? right. And that guy has a clear advantage over you. The reload time on re on launchers is brutal, right? Mm -hmm. It takes forever, as it should, because you don't want them being used as normally offensive based weapons like this. You know they're meant for clearing out big rooms or shooting down kill streaks. You know, so you have to be um, really kind of mindful of, of what you're facing here. And this, is, this, this has got a lot of arc, this launcher. This is the China Lake, so using it takes a lot of skill. You know, it's the explosive power isn't that strong, you know. So you get a really nice lob distance, which can give you some really amazing kills, but it's not easy to use uh, at all. So, you know, it's just getting through. That, that was a near direct hit, and that guy didn't die, you know. So you could... Uh, be very careful when you're playing gun game and to get to the launchers, you know. Find a good spot, try to protect your lead. Try to go for, you know, groups of people. Always shoot launchers against the back sides of walls so you can pick up the, um, the splash damage from it. Those are good tactics and, you know. Oh, oh yeah. that guy just got a double kill. Yeah. You only advance one weapon even with the double kill. Okay. Uh, you know, so, uh, but uh, it sure does make for good theater uh, coverage later when you go back and, and uh, show off your highlight reel. See, so how much time she's had to spend with this China Lake, you know, someone came along and took her spot. Yeah. There you go. That's a good, nice. that's a really good kill because the guy had his back to that wall. So, you know, if you're up against guys with launchers, stay out in the open. Don't wall hug, right? It's actually a very common tactic to wall hug, right? So that you uh, have the protection on all sides of you. But it's actually really dangerous to do here in, in the end game. Let's see if Rizzo can finish this off. So close. We're about to witness magic. Yeah, it's one minute though. So we gotta get the, <laughs> gotta get it going. No pressure. Uh, Will not help you win, knifing, <laughs> even with the ballistic knife. I mean, will humiliate the other player, but... So you see, the, you know, you, the game's tuned to be like this, where, where the, um, 
you know, you're going to end up with these right down to the wire kind of games, you know, and, mo and many games uh, uh, work very similar to this one in terms of the pacing or timing. Yeah, so she's got a, she's got unlimited ammo here, so she can do a lot. Oh, it's, it's getting hot. There here. it is. All right. So finally, a first place in the money finish. Nice, that for, was beautiful. For Black Ops demo, and we'll get to see this final kill cam and see how it got done here. Hear the audio tune out. Oh, the guy right in front of you, too. Oh, <laughs> Man, that hurts. <laughs> you can always count on a good final kill cam in uh, any uh, wager match game mode. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so it's time to see if Rizzo can keep up that victory streak with this next wager match mode. David? What's going on here? You got Sharpshooter right here, and, and Sharpshooter is going to be the game that the gun purists love. So in, in Sharpshooter, the way that it works is every 45 seconds, you're going to get a brand new gun. So the gun is totally and completely random. So right now, we started off with the Kimboed uh, machine pistols, you know, the dual wielders. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 45 seconds, this is going to change to, sorry, well now 27 seconds, this is going to change to uh, something else and what that is nobody could tell you because it's absolutely random the attachments are random the gun choice is random and and uh, that keeps things fresh every single time you play it now are all the players using the same weapons at once or is it random for each player that's right they're all actually the same so when Rizzo switches in five seconds everyone will switch to the same exact gun okay so, so this it's is an even playing field absolutely it is it, it, you know so we went from machine pistol to SMG with the red dot, right? So, you know, uh, she has sleight of hand now. So, and this is the only game, uh, the only wager match game mode that actually has perks in it. Okay. And, but, you know, unlike the traditional mechanism of getting perks, uh, we simply just call them bonuses, mm -hmm. and you get them by going on kill streaks. So it's a little bit of a mind twist for people at first because you're getting perks for going on kill streaks, right? But um, it's a way to reward players who are doing really well. So like Rizzo here is now on a pretty good streak. So if she can keep this up, she'll get to the top bonus, which is a scoring multiplier. L um, like some other game modes uh, in wager matches, it's purely based on score. So you just want to get as many kills as you can as fast as you can. And let's talk about the, the map that we're in here. What's this one called? Yeah, this is, uh, this is the wager match version of Launch. Launch is a medium-sized map. Uh, played pretty good in wager matches with the regular map, but we've made some changes. Some map paths are blocked off. Those are act actually reflected in the mini-map there in the top left-hand corner. If you actually compare that mini-map to the regular launch map, you'll be able to see the distinction and playable space here. And it's pretty much the Cold War personified, right, with those yeah, this rockets is about to take off? Yeah, sorry. This is the you know the, this is the what we call the you know launch. It's it's a Russian cosmodrome, right? It's a Russian launch facility where they you know they put some Cold War maybe satellites, maybe chemical weapons, who knows, into space. And this rocket, uh, of course, uh, the fans have seen it uh, take off in the middle of the match. You can see that path had been blocked off, and normally you could go underneath there and go under the rocket, but not in uh, not in the wager match version. Oh. This, gun, this this game mode is really popular inside the the group because you know obviously as a shooter studio, um, you know the, the guns are everything to people. So right. so you know basically being able to randomly give in a gun. You know, it's really also just a fun way to test weapons, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because as much as you want people to use all the guns that we actually have available inside the game, people have their favorite guns, right? You got your LMG guys, you got your SMG guys, you got your snipers, and they're always going to take those guns when they're playing in the play test because first-person shooter developers are intrinsically pretty competitive and they want to win. Right. So you have to do things, and I've actually had to go and ban people from using guns or actually take them out of the game <laughs> so we could get feedback on other weapons, right? But, but, not, but if with a game mode like Gun Game, you don't have that problem because you know it's a random weapon, and if the game mode's fun, then people will enjoy playing the game mode, and therefore we'll have some good data uh, and feedback on the actual weapons.
While we're on the subject, David, what's your preferred loadout? Oh man, good question. You know, um, I'm kind of a fan of rolling kind of stealth classes. Uh -huh. it, it depends on the map size, but sure. I t usually take a, an assault rifle or SMG uh, with a suppressor and a red dot, so therefore I'm using the hardened perk, so I can have both of those attached at the same time. Okay. But I also like ninja, and I obviously like the ghost perks. Uh, I just prefer to rock stealthy. That's just sort mm. of the, m my play style, my personal play style. Um, you know, but it, it's uh, there's a lot of really good options. You know, mixing and matching with the crater class system. Yeah, that's a that's a variable zoom there, so that particular attachment lets you actually uh, zoom in more than once, up to three levels with the variable zoom. That's new. So she's doing pretty good. First place with 35 seconds to play, um, you know, and then uh, on on uh, one of the most popular guns in the game right now. It's the FAMAS. It's a really steady gun, high fire rate. Not not a lot of damage, but certainly, you know, um, with the rate of fire and how how even killed it is, you can play a lot of lead pretty quickly. So look at that. I mean, you know, the final rounds are are uh, you you know bonus rounds. So there's more points at stake. So guys who are falling behind can get caught up there. And there you go, man, Rizzo, for another first place finish <laughs> and in the money. Good job. Nice work. Another 30 CP in the bank. <laughs> Don't spend it all in one place. <laughs> Thank you, Rizzo. Well, David, we've seen a lot of stuff so far. You, we've seen a lot of different game modes, a lot of different maps, and we could probably just keep going because there's a lot more to see in the multiplayer, but you know, the game's out soon, so we should probably maintain some surprises for the viewers at home. There's right? a couple of uh, surprises that uh, have not been completely out there, but you know, if you're a big fan and you've been following the entire th thread through the launch, you start to piece it together. All right, so for the uh, very few viewers at home who don't have the release date circled on their calendar, go ahead and remind us when Black Ops is going to be out in stores and the platforms it's out for. It's November 9th, and it's for the PC, the Wii, the 360, and the PlayStation 3. All right, David, again, thanks a lot. We thanks, really appreciate man. It's it. good to see you again. Yeah, you as well. So there you guys have it. That's your now-playing look at Call of Duty Black Ops. Thanks a lot for watching. See ya.